will fade. Bobo. Cliff. Seems like it's been a while since I've spoken to you. Yeah, I did the uh, last episode. You were you were just yeah you were heading down to see those snow tracks down on the pines. So I spoke to Angie, the Snow White Bigfoot woman that, with the dermal prints and all that, and that was a good one. We got good feedback on that, so that went pretty well. Well, cool, cool. I, I wish I could say the same about the footprint investigation. Basically, the story was um, on Monday morning. Um, the property owners went out to the, the guy went out to his truck to go to work in the morning about five thirty in the morning, and in the snow were these large footprints. There, they were. I did the math. I measured the guy's shoes. I had pictures of the guy's shoes with the prints in them. So I did a little bit of uh, you know fifth grade math basically, and I determined that the prints were about sixteen inches, give or take a little bit, sixteen maybe seventeen somewhere in there. And so um, the guy was flabbergasted. Um, just like, what is going on here? Uh, he, he, there were about five or eight, five, six, seven, eight prints in the driveway. Um, the footprint that I sent you guys, the photograph was by far the clearest. The rest of them were a little bit more melted out. But when I saw those, I said, well, first of all, they're fresh because the guy said that they weren't there the night before and they were there in the morning. So they were fresh. Um, unlikely to be hoaxes because like, who's going to go walk around in that, you know, like at three in the morning. I mean, maybe they're hoaxes. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, there's not really enough to go on in the prints, unfortunately. But I, uh, I was thinking, okay, this is interesting because I know that they're fresh. And, you know, if I go out to one of my spots and I walk around, if I find footprints out there, I don't know when they were put there. You know, I could guess, based on erosion and wind and all that, you know, just wearing away and gravity. You can guess how long a footprint has been in the ground, but you really don't know. So these circumstances where you know the night it was put down are fairly rare. I've had a couple of those in the last uh, month or two, um, but they're fairly rare. So this was a really interesting opportunity. So I called Darby back in, uh, you know, North Carolina to say, hey, this happened. This seems like an opportunity. Um, and he says it actually was because everybody's always ranting about D- eDNA. eDNA is going to solve this, and maybe it will. But at this point, eDNA is pretty expensive, especially when you don't have a, a target species. Because again, we're trying to prove that this target species even exists with DNA. So um, in order to get eDNA and then go through all the hoops and all that other jazz and figure out that there is an unknown primate species in there, well, that's a a very, very expensive proposition. Um, Very time-consuming and expensive. But, see, see, because part of that thing is that there's so much other DNA in the woods. Like if I found footprints and I took the soil sample from underneath them, there's a lot of other animals that live in that wood those woods there, like rodents and deer and bear and flying squirrels and birds and all sorts of other things. Um, And their DNA is also everywhere, right? So, um, and of course, if we had a sample of of the unknown species DNA, well, that kind of gives us a target, gives us a bullseye to aim for, and that would drop the cost significantly. Um, I'm getting, by the way, I know I'm kind of rambling, but I'm getting somewhere. Just bear with me for a second. Um, so if we have a target, it would drop the cost and the time and all the effort significantly, but we don't have that at this point. Um, but the snow prints offer a unique opportunity. I, I, I've been informed because unlike footprints in the mud where everything and their mother's walking around through the woods and leaving their DNA and sloughing off skin cells and breathing and doing all these biological things that leave DNA traces on snow, if as long as the foot did not push through the snow layer and touch the ground, the vast majority of the DNA that would be in that footprint in the snow would be from the foot that made that footprint. It wouldn't be contaminated, or, or if that's even the right word. It, um, it, 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 it would be mostly the target species that left the footprint. So that's a unique opportunity. I didn't. I wasn't really aware of this until I spoke to Darby about it. But, you know, but Darby's brilliant. He has all sorts of interesting insights and thoughts. And so uh, I called him and I said, "Well, this is an interesting opportunity," and he totally agreed. So I got together a, 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 a snowprint eDNA kit pretty quick. You know, at the local Walgreens. I went and went shopping real fast and did all sorts of sterilization procedures and stuff the night before. Got everything ready to go. Um, one of my employees, my friend Tyler, um, he hopped in the car with me the next morning, and uh, we drove the three and a half hours, yeah, three hours and twenty minutes, one way to Lapine to find that all the snow had melted, unfortunately, and there was no trace. There were some other marks nearby, 
Um, some of them were clearly boot marks. I don't think that that's, that was what we're dealing with. So there were some other larger marks that may have been rather melted out and, you know, ambiguous prints. They were about the right size, about the right, kind of the right shape and about the right distance. But basically at the end of the day, went down there for pretty much nothing. Yeah. But that's, that's big footing. I've been on such a roll lately that, you know, I was due for a bad, a bad trip, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 you've been on fire. I got to go out and talk to uh, Dave McCoy, Sil McCoy's son from the back in the '60s, the forest, the cat driver out there, the forestry engineer. Oh yeah, yeah, I know exactly who Sil McCoy is. Uh, I don't know if our if our audience does though, because we have a lot of kind of new Bigfooters that perhaps aren't as um, familiar with the Bigfoot history. Yeah, if you look back at the '60s, he was integral, like he was an integral figure in all that, and when. He was a, a bulldozer operator for the Forest Service, and he ended up working his way to be like head engineer of the roads out there for Six Rivers. Real respected guy, excellent tracker, excellent hunter. He and he found prints, and he actually cast over fifty casts at eight different locations. Yeah, so he was out there during that time, and like he met with Mel Hester and those guys down in the early sixties down in the High End Palm. He met that's where he first met Roger Patterson back in like sixty three, I guess, looking at the High End Palm tracks. Um, stayed in touch with him. He was a cohort of Al Hodgson who owned the Storm Willow Creek. That was kind of like, he was like the main guy, like the, um, you know, pre-internet and all that. He was kind of like a focal point for exchanging. If anyone, that, anyone that went looking for Bigfoot, in Bluff Creek area, Humboldt, would stop and see Al Hodgson. And, and when you left, you'd report whatever you found. So he kind of was the gatherer of all the information around there. And still was one of his trusted like cohorts. Yeah, and still got over eight, uh, eight different tracking events. He got over 50 casts and he had multiple repeats of one with like a, a mangled foot with a missing toe. And it wasn't, it doesn't look the same as the cripple foot, you know, cast from up in the blues. But um, uh, so anyways, he just heard from one of his cousins that she might have some of the casts stored down in uh, the Bay area. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. Like maybe three or four or something. Still, I mean, that that's, you know, any cast from that time period is of great interest just because that, that was the heyday of Bigfooting. It was when everything was getting going. It was, everything was new at that point. Um, there wasn't, you know, you know, there, like say, for example, now if, if we, we found a footprint and there was a nice mid-tarsal pressure ridge, it would not be nearly as big a deal as something from the 1960s because that uh, the, Dr. Meldrum's work is publicly available. But back then, that was that was unknown. That was unheard of. So that early evidence offers us a, an interesting glimpse and a, an opportunity for congruence in the evidence between what they found then and today, what we now know today, based on um, the people whose shoulders we stand upon. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes from that. Excellent. Excellent. So did you get to see any photographs or, or, or anything like that? No, no, no. Now, of course, Sill's Sil's dead. Who did you speak to? His son Dave and he, Dave was there when they came out with uh, when Roger and Bob came out and called Al. They also called Sill, and Dave was uh, twelve years old. Went with his dad to Willow Creek and had a. Uh, they went to the restaurant there and met up with. It was him, Al, his father, and Roger and Bob. Wow, that's great. Yeah, he said he he said uh, if Roger Patterson got if Roger Patterson. Got hoaxed, he sure as heck didn't know it because he was eyes popping out of his head. He was so excited and just wound up high energy. And yeah, then he, uh, he, so he just said, he goes, there's no way he was part of it. If he got hoaxed, he wasn't part of it. That's what he kept saying. Oh, wow. So, so just to be clear, he saw Roger that same day. Yeah. When Roger came out and met with Al, he met with Al and Syl and Syl brought his son. Wow. Wow. So that's actual, um, vis- like uh, firsthand, you know, witness uh, of, of the events that day that we've only heard about, you know? Right. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. He didn't really remember Bob too much about Bob. You know, he's like, so I just knew Roger because Roger had been to our house a couple of times in the early sixties and he, you know, his father knew him and he knew him. And he also said he had uh, John Green. He knew his dad really knew, was good friends with John Green and John Green had been down there a few times to their place. Now, for, for our listeners, um, if you're wondering who we're talking about, I know Bobo explained a pretty good uh, riff about uh, who Sil McCoy is, but you've probably seen Sil McCoy. Sil McCoy is in a very famous photograph, um, a couple of different photographs, actually, with Bob Titmus back from the early 1960s. Um, one of the photographs is Bob Titmus and a gentleman, Sil McCoy, on a porch of a cabin or a shack or something like that with some footprint casts in front of them. Those footprint casts are the high palm prints from um, April of 1963, and that is Sil McCoy. 
I believe Sil McCoy is also in another photograph with Bob Titmus from taken at the same place in the same time. I don't know who the pho- photographer was, so maybe it was John Green. Cause these pictures are in John John Green's books, and they're holding up two footprint casts and um, with the caption, if I remember right, something like two feet equals a yard because um, two they're, they're only two of the footprint casts together and up with a yardstick over it and showing how large they are, and it's kind of a play on words there. Um, but that is Sil McCoy. Um, just one of these unsung heroes of Bigfooting that was doing it forever um, and didn't write any books. He didn't didn't do any TV spots or anything. So very few people know about him and, and his work. So it's fanta- fantastic that you got a hold of a relative of Sil McCoy. Now, um, I spoke to, I think it was Charlie McCoy. Is that right? Is that another brother brothers? Yeah. Yeah, I spoke to Charlie um, uh, like maybe last year. I got a hold of his number because of the um, – uh, of the footprint photographs that came to me via Dr. Russ Jones um, from Edie Gardner, who's an elderly woman. Out now, she lives out in West Virginia, but she grew up in um, the Trinity Alps, basically, and it was on her mother and father's property that the High and Palm prints were cast, were found and cast. Um, and she told me that her mom was out there working while her father was was. She was like clearing brush or something on the property, a, new, a new, newly bought property. And her dad was at work and she got, her mom got all sketched out. Something was watching her. She didn't know what it was. And so um, then she found footprints and she called, I believe she called Syl McCoy to come take a look. And she, and because her, no, no, she called her husband who I think worked with Syl McCoy. And then Syl came out. Syl, by the way, is short for Sylvester, if you don't know. Um, Syl came out with Bob Titmus who cast those footprints. So yeah, uh, Sil McCoy was all over the place and his offspring are still out there and sharing the stories. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Eric from the Bigfoot Museum in Willow Creek, he's the one that set it up and he's really, you know, trying to dig into this stuff like that. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, that's why that's what we do here at the NABC, of course. But down there, I, um, you know, that's the epicenter. That was like ground zero in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I'm glad that Eric's Eric kind of taken the lead on that. I also had a conversation with Eric this past week, kind of uh, comparing notes on museums and all that sort of stuff. And we're going to try to get together at some point and uh, maybe flesh out some um, opportunities for both of us. You know, to, to either share resources or you know, I, I said anything I can do for you, let me know because um, you know I don't view any other Bigfoot museum as competition. I view it as part of the team, so to speak. You know, doing doing God doing God's work. So yeah, he's a really good dude. Seemed like it. Seemed like a really cool guy. Yeah, he wrote. Um, he's I, I, he's a member of the NABC actually. So um, that's how I met him. He wrote me a, a private message on our Patreon page, and um, I reached out and I said, "Here's my number. Give me a call." And I spoke to him just a few days ago, I guess, maybe last week. Yeah, really nice guy. So I, I'm gonna try to make it down to um, Willow Creek this summer at some point. So I'll, I'll let you know when that happens. And I'm particularly interested in going in the bluff to see what's burned and what's not. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, a lot of people have been telling me they, they're going in there. And I say, well, good. Take pictures. Show me what's going on. I'm really interested in seeing, you know, because with, with, with man, if all the foliage is burned away, that place is so prone to landslides. Yeah, yeah. I'll be very surprised if any of those roads survive, yeah, especially in the burnout areas. Oh, dude, it's going to be ugly. It's going to be ugly going out there. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, checking it out and just, you know, sitting on my on the, the hood of my Jeep and weeping quietly. As I often do. (laughs) (laughs) Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Oh, man. So something else has has happened since I spoke to you last. Um, The North American Bigfoot Center here, uh, we did a booth at the Sportsman Show, the Pacific Northwest Sportsman Show, which is one of these like hunting, fishing, boat shows sort of thing. Um, And boy, it was it was a grueling, punishing gig. I will tell you that, Um, you know, it's one thing doing a one or two days at a Bigfoot conference and having people come up and say hi to me for 12 hours a day. But it is another thing to have uh, 60,000 people pass through the expo center here in Portland and uh, 10% of them or 20, 15% of them are like, Oh, Bigfoot. That's cool. I didn't know there's a Bigfoot museum. And uh, there's another full 10, 20% of the people who are just like rolling their eyes at me and just muttering what an idiot under their breath. Yeah. For the most part, the reception was, was maybe lukewarm, but, but a couple of people were quite interested. And I, I, on Saturday, um, I uh, took 12, fi- 12 sighting reports, and people seem like 
the, the skeptics seem very shocked at that. They say, well, dude, we're, look, look around, man. There's we're at a hunting fishing show. Certainly, there are a lot of witnesses here. A couple of the guides, um, uh, notably uh, uh, some guides from Alaska, came up to me and uh, shared some vocalizations they recorded and their stories. Oh, cool. Did you get copies? Uh, yeah, yeah. They sent them to me. Yeah. And then um, he also they had previously sent it to Dave uh, uh, Dave Ellis, too. So he had, already has copies, which is kind of nice. Um, I was kind of wandering around, just, you know, tripping out and getting out of the booth because, man, those are long days, like 10, 12 hours in those in that cement booth. You know, hey, have you heard of the Bigfoot Museum yet? Like, what? Pshaw! And like walking away and rolling their eyes. Like, that gets a little old. But um, I was walking around and went up to a BC booth, a British Columbia guide, and said, hey, you ever seen a Sasquatch? And he like looks at me and he go, I don't really talk about that stuff unless I know who I'm talking to. And I go, oh, I'm Cliff. I was some nerd on some TV show and I have the booth over there, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, he goes, and then he goes, no, I haven't seen one, but here's my stories. And then he sat and he told me like four stories. You know, he hadn't seen one, but he found beautiful prints in the clay and all that sort of, you know, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of people, once you get past that non, you know, that, that gruff exterior, um, have half, I mean, so many of those people have stories, but gosh, um, a couple very interesting things popped up one. Um, I don't know if he's listening or not. I, 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 I thought he said he was a listener. Some guy named Hoodoo was his name was a Humboldt character. I'll say that, you know, and you know, the type Bobs. um, he's like probably sixties or something like that. Um, sixties, that decade year old, you know, big, big, big sort of, not quite a cowboy hat, not quite, a, not quite a crazy person hat, but somewhere in between. Um, he was talking about seeing one down, um, I think it was Southern Humboldt somewhere, kind of down by Honeydew somewhere that he saw one there run a walk across the road right in front of him. And he t- talked to him for quite a while. He told me about friends of his in Shasta, that um, have a big footprint um, that they cast on their property or nearby their property. Um, so he said he was going to look into that. Uh, we'll see if he does or not. That'd be cool. So who do, if you are listening, got my eye, I'm waiting for you to call. There was, there was one guy though, who I really wanted to talk about on the podcast because he said that he was as a 10 year old boy in the early 1970s, he was given a cast. And then a few years later, another cast um, and he doesn't know if they're originals or if they're copies, but what he does remember is that they come from a property by Lake Merwin, which is just south of, uh, you know, Mount St. Helens, Lewis River area, from a property there that had Bigfoots popping by every once in a while. And I was thinking to myself, the only other thing, the only other Lake Merwin casts that I am aware of at all, um, let alone from the 60s and 70s is from that same property that Roger Patterson used to go to. He had, he had friends down on Lake Merwin and like the Lewis river somewhere that he would go by. And they, and I believe if I remember right, um, Roger either cast prints down there on the property or maybe got prints from the property owners. And I'm wondering, could the, could these casts first of all, be original. That would be fantastic. Um, if they're something unknown from the data set, it's always great to expand the data set, but, um, could it be that th- these are from the same property, therefore the same Bigfoots, or maybe even the same casting events? Uh, he says he doesn't remember anything about them because they're in boxes somewhere, but he says that the information is written on the back of the cast. So really, really interesting stuff. I've got a few leads. To f- oh, there's another one. I'm so sorry. I'm de- dominating the conversation, but man, so much happens in my life, Bigfoot related. So I just spoke to this guy about an hour ago. Actually, I called him right before we came on the air here. This one gentleman, the same's Marv, um, real nice guy, super nice guy. Um, he's a local guy. He came up to me and was asking questions and he eventually shared with me that he saw one of these things. Now he's in his uh, early sixties, but he saw one of these things in night, actually two Sasquatches in 1973. He and his father were doing a, uh, a horseback ride around Timothy Lake in uh, Mount Hood National Forest. Um, Timothy Lake is still very active today, particularly the south side of the lake on the border of the um, the reservation, the Warm Springs Reservation over there. Um, but they were doing, um, they were circumnavigating the lake on horseback. And at one point, about two thirds of the way around, they got off the horses and just took a break. And he was a young man, or well, he was a boy, I think, I think he said he was like, I don't know, 10 or something. I, I forget how old he was at that point, because I forget how old he is now. I could probably do the math and figure it out, but I'm not gonna. So anyway, he gets off the horse and he's hanging out with his dad or whatever. And then he something catches his eye. And long story short, about 100 yards away, 150 yards away, he sees a head 
of a Sasquatch looking over a log. And like it keeps bobbing up and down and like, you know, hiding and then peeking over the top and stuff. And he's going, no way, you know, look at that. And, um, and then uh, to the left of it, he see- something else catches his eye and there's another one you know, a short distance away from the first, um, behind a tree and it keeps poking its head out from behind this tree. Well, um, he calmly walks over to his horse, pulls out his Kodak 110 camera and snaps two pictures of these things. Um, and he told me straight out, it's like, yeah, they're not good pictures. They're, you know, Kodak 110 film camera at a hundred yards or 150 yards, but they're in there. Um, they're not good pictures. They're not going to convince anybody, but um, and so I asked him and he's, uh, currently looking for those photographs in his storage boxes. So he would share them with the NABC. Um, and so we'd be, uh, putting them on display at some point. Oh, you're right. Oh, I, I just love that kind of thing. Like, even if they're not good, they're clearly not going to be great pictures, right? I mean, there's no question about that, but, um, how cool is that? You know, it, and it fits really nicely with another display we hear, we have here at the NABC that you've seen where this guy went, um, backpacking at Lake at about Jefferson. And um, he was getting followed by something. He never saw it. And he found a footprint. And then he found handprints in the snow. And that scared him so bad he left. And um, he gave me the original Polaroid handprints that are hanging on the wall. And also uh, the actual camera that he took those photographs with. And, you know, it's not groundbreaking. It's not earth shattering in any way or anything like that. It's just cool little tidbits of history. You know, and that's the kind of thing that I just love displaying that kind of thing in the NABC. So it sounds like we have a lead on another one of these things as well um, with this gentleman, Marv, from Timothy Lake. So I'm looking forward to seeing those. Yeah, for all the old cast stories, I've always heard like, oh, my uncle cast one back in the 70s or whatever. Like they almost, I think I've only seen like one ever turn up, you know, like that where they, you know, it's around somewhere that they can never find it from my, my experience. Very, very rare. Very, very rare. Oh, and, and you know, I, I know that we have a lot to do and I blah, blah, blah. Cliff's just blabbing the entire time and I'm so sorry about this. But here's another interesting thing that's happened in the last week or two. Kenny Brown, Bigfooter out in Ohio, super nice guy. I know the entire Brown family I consider to be friends. I see him at the Ohio conference every single year and I know they're listening. So, oh, they're wonderful, right? And they're listeners. So, hello, Browns. Hello, Browns. Love you. Um, but anyway, Kenny wrote me. And said, hey, Cliff, um, somebody has some stompers on eBay. They go, oh, really? And I, I took a look at them. And I go, oh, my God. Yeah, look at those. And he, the, the story on eBay is a little bit different than what I got in person. Um, but the long and short of it, he wanted way too much money for him. And he didn't get it. And then he dropped the price to another number that was still way too much. And he didn't get that one either. So I wrote him a, a private message and said, hey, I have a museum. Can we want to work something out? And long story short, we worked something out. Um, And so, um, I got another pair of fake stompers. Now, now the, 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 the the quest, I guess, is to learn more about them because I have some suspicions about them at this point and I need to get them verified. What area? That's just it. That's just it. He got them in central, not central Oregon, but like Western Oregon, but like, you know, Southern Oregon, I guess, you know, um, I, and I have a, about a, a 17 minute interview with the gentleman that, um, our, our, our lovely and talented volunteer Joanna at the museum here is currently transcribing, um, with all the information in it. So she's working on that right now, but, uh, basically he got them in about, you know, the numbers are fuzzy, obviously he he's, this gentleman's in the seventies and he's thinking back decades. The numbers are a little fuzzy, but he's guessing that probably about 1968, um, he was given these stompers. Okay. He, in, in the initial eBay listing, he said that it, those were, um, made in the forties. I am, I doubt it. I doubt it. I think that they were made in the fifties or early sixties, but I could be wrong about that. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to be finding out more real soon and I'll get to that. So this guy basically was given these fake stompers that were already used at the time. So somebody had been hoaxing some stuff. They're pretty big. They're about 17, 18 inches long. This guy got the stompers and he went out and hoaxed some stuff a couple times. Like most, he said he that was never caught except for one time he was caught in Idaho hoaxing some prints. Um, and so I have all that information written down and everything like that. But he got them while working at a mill. Um, and the owner of the mill was a guy named Don Boswell. Or, yeah. And there's a Boswell senior and junior. And if you look up Don Boswell, um, The thing that comes up is uh, um, that story from uh, um, Longview, Washington. No, 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 from Toledo, Washington, um, about uh, Ray Wallace dying and all that other stuff. 
and um, and it mentions Boswell in conjunction with Rant Mullins. Um, the other hoaxer, there's a picture of Rant in Dr. Jeff Meldrum's book, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, with the two stompers. Um, those stompers he carved for a night, uh, he probably had those before, but he used them in 1982 for like a news piece or whatever. Um, we have those 1982 original stompers with Rant Mullen's autograph on the back of them on display in the North American Bigfoot Center. Now, these, these are older than that, much older than that. And um, Don Boswell supposedly went hoaxing with Rant Mullins. These very well could be another set of Rant Mullins' stompers or Ray Wallace's stompers. I don't know which yet, but um, this coming weekend um, through a wonderful friend of mine named Darlene, um, she has now arranged me meeting Don Boswell, who is 101 years old, along with Dale Lee Wallace, you know, I think that's what is it, Ray's son or, or nephew or something like that. Um, I'm going to meet both of these gentlemen this week and have a lengthy uh, story written, heckle full, heckling full um, interview with these guys because I'm probably pretty foolish to them because I think Sasquatches are real and they're both completely confident that each of them invented it. Oh, God. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. But the thing is, um, Boswell was hoaxing stuff in the, in the, um, in the 60s. You know, he was hoaxing, he was hoaxing things down in Northern California. So I'm hoping to find out where and when as closely as possible to try to track down some of these things. And like, for example, th these, I, I have a sneaky suspicion that these particular stompers that I have may have been the stompers or may have been behind the, the one footprint cast that Barbara Wasson got that I am in possession of because I own the Barbara Wasson collection, you know? Yeah. I, I, I have not pulled out the cast yet because, um, this is my first day back at work and the stompers that were at work. So I didn't, didn't come back here this weekend for a change. Um, so I need to take these home today and I'm going to compare them, but still the guy told me that he hoaxed several times around Southern Oregon. Um, and, uh, and the time period matches when this guy was hoaxing. The area kind of matches. He told me that there was a group of three Bigfoot researchers that would come out. Walt told me this, by the way, about these prints that I have, these stompers. Walt told me that there were a group of three Sasquatch researchers that would come out um, whenever he made these prints because he would just call them and say that, hey, there are prints on the ground. He didn't say, I'm lying to you. I'm hoaxing. He would, he would, he would lie to these three Bigfoot researchers to come out. And then those Bigfoot researchers would give him like 20 bucks. For, for reporting it to him. It's like, wow, that's, that's shady, first of all. But second of all, um, who were these three guys? He couldn't remember their names. He didn't remember what they looked like or anything. He just remembers were these three researchers that were really interested in fresh footprint finds. So he said when unemployment ran out, every once in a while, he'd go stomping around and, and share them. Crazy stuff, right? Yeah, all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, hopefully I'm going to get to the bottom of these stompers in the next week or two. Hopefully I will have a little bit more information because, you know, I, I mean, if any of that early, you know, early 60s stuff from like, say, Bluff Creek or somewhere down there or the High and Palm stuff for that matter, any of that stuff, although High and Palm, I'm confident, aren't, aren't hoax. So you, there's some really telltale features in there. Um, but some of the other stuff I'm kind of on the fence about, you know. Um, there's some things that I, I suspect were hoaxes, some things that I, I, I don't know, but I'm open to them being hoaxes. And then there's some other things that clearly are not. So I always think about Matt Moneymaker and, and for different reasons than you always think about Matt Moneymaker. But one of the reasons <laughs> that I think about Matt Mon Moneymaker is uh, one, of the, one of the things he's said that just rings so true. Um, he always said it um, when uh, applying to um, footage, but I say it applying to footprint casts. Um, he always said that to be an expert in real Bigfoot footage, you have to be an expert in fake Bigfoot footage. And I really feel the same about footprints as well. To be an expert in real Sasquatch prints, you have to be an expert, or at least learn as much as you can about fake Bigfoot footprints. Absolutely. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Yeah, so what we get, we get to look at uh, what's in the news, yeah? What's the latest things that we've caught our eye the last several weeks? We have a small number of, um, of articles, which is good because we actually don't have much time. I've been talking the whole time. So um, would, would, would you like to start with any particular article, Bobo? The one that caught my eye at first was the uh, humor one, like where the large, the great apes, like orangutans, chimps, 
uh, bonobos and gorillas will tease each other, especially the younger ones, like how humans tease, like different than play, but actually teasing. Yeah, yeah. Th- this particular article, we the one the version we read, uh, it was all over the news for a minute. There was from USA Today. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what the date was on there. I guess it doesn't really matter. But it was a study kind of um, pointing out that apes play, which isn't that big of a deal. It makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, um, I think actually when I shared this with you, you you kind of said something to the effect of "duh," you know, and and and, and rightly so, and rightly so. But what does this have to do with Bigfoot exactly? You know, I think that is the interesting conversation to be had. I'm convinced that Bigfoots have senses of humor. I mean, I know people and people that have like a lot of repeat, like, you know, visitations and that sort of thing. Everyone that has a long term interaction with them say they have like they like to play pranks. They like to hide things. They like to hide your tools, hide things of yours, then put them back somewhere else, maybe different. Uh, that's the, that's the main thing I know about them. Like, you know, doing stuff like that. And then I, uh, my dad heard that one, uh, those ones laugh in New Mexico when he was putting on a change in his underwear and he was pulling, you know, it was like freezing cold out. Like it was like 20 something degrees out and he's butt naked trying to pull his jockeys on and his toe got his, uh, the waist, waistband got, got, got caught between his big toe and his, uh, second toe. And when he went to pull up, it made him pitch forward and fall and from the barn, he heard that, he, 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 and then he heard a, oh, and then the, all the, the, like, it sounded like the big ones scolded the little ones. And then when my dad yelled, um, I heard the yell, and then we heard the running. They were in the hayloft of the barn. They just ran out the back and jumped down, and they ran off, and that's where the the big ones stepped on a sheet of uh, sheet metal and crinkled it, and it was 15 and a half inches. It wasn't like a perfect outline of a foot, but you could see where the heel and the big toe and everything was. But yeah, like my dad's like, yeah, those, those little bastards were laughing at me when I fell. I heard that from a lot of people that they they like to uh, screw around with you and like you know play little games. A couple things popped out to me when I read this article. First of all, it said um, that it wasn't f- like like when when they were observing the behavior that they interpreted as play. It was interesting because at one point, here's a quote from um, one of the people, one of the researchers. We were actually able to use the video we had and look through the video to find places where the apes were interacting with one another in a way that wasn't fully play and wasn't fully aggression. It was sort of somewhere in the middle, to finish the quote. I think that right there is interesting. Very interesting, actually. Because when you think about the uh, the reported Sasquatch behaviors out there, how many of these people are just like... It makes me wonder how many human witnesses are misinterpreting what the Sasquatches are doing. Oh, a lot. Maybe, or 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 maybe the, you'd be a fool to go out there and interpret it as play. But maybe some of these aggression displays are actually just Bigfoot's messing with you and having fun, which is kind of what I've, I've been wondering about for quite a while. I think that might be the case. Um, but at the same time, maybe that, that might be a foolish thing to assume if one's actually pretty pissed at you. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I mean, throwing what, throwing rocks, you know, um, slapping the outside of houses, you know, that's kind of aggressive and it's kind of playful. It depends on how you want to interpret it. Really, it depends on how the Sasquatch means it, but we don't know that, and there's no way to know that. Um, what about touching the tents? You know, that 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 seems like a curiosity thing, but you know, it, from if you're scared inside of a tent, that could be very, uh, uh, it could be interpreted as aggression, right? Yeah, I think I think scared like scared humans to them is like, oh, it's go time. It's time to screw with these. These ones are going to be fun to mess with. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, another thing that I thought was interesting is that they they said that they couldn't prove it, but it seems that the young ones do it more. Oh yeah, and I think we see that in Sasquatch behavior too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it seems like the ones that screw around are five to seven and seven and a half feet tall, but usually like around the you know, five to six and a half, I'd say is the most five to seven, and then it's a seven and a half. But if, if people are accurate in their descriptions, yeah, those are the ones that are screwed. Especially like, because uh, I've always thought that you know that they get together like like maybe like young lions, or the, the males will pack up until they're you know when they're out when they're too too big to be in the family pod, then but not big enough to have their own you know separate zone. They'll, they'll get together like lions and pal around, and those are the ones that the natives say really screw with you like love to just play hijinks and stuff that's why i used to always thought a lot of those road crossings with the small ones where they ran right in front of the car like on a lonely country road i was always convinced there's 
their buddies are like high fiving them on the side, like, "Oh, see how close out!" Like they just must love it when they see a car lock up its brakes and skid, or just hear hear the, as the car passes like going, hear the you know coming from out inside the vehicle, "Holy sh-, you know, what was that?" Yeah, I'm sure they get off on that. I, I, we'll we'll find out someday in the future, hopefully. But I think that's what I think it is. Well, apparently they, they mostly had, they I think, completely had video of juvenile apes, which kind of skewed their data, unfortunately. So they're not sure if uh, juveniles do it more. But I, I would agree. I think juveniles do it more. And that, I think you can safely, you know, like, uh, at least guess that, maybe not assume that, but guess that based on human behavior. Because we can't forget we're apes. We That is our family. We share so many of our behaviors with the other great apes. That's why, that's one of the many reasons it's so interesting to study them. It's because we learn more about humans, you know, and that, that's obviously true in humans, um, that uh, the juveniles are more playful and whatnot. I thought that was really interesting. And, of course, with all these stories of, of juvenile, possibly juvenile Sasquatches and whatnot, and, you know, I, I have to reflect upon, you know, our, one of our research spots. We've been finding a, a 12-inch footprint a lot. A lot more than the 14, although we've been finding the 14 as well. And then maybe once we have evidence of a big male in the area. So th- that goes to that juvenile thing. Like the, not only are they perhaps, you know, more careless or whatever, they probably play a little bit more. Maybe that's probably, maybe that's why more sign is left. Or maybe that's why they, they are less careful because they're playing, you know? I mean, at the end of the day, a six foot human probably is very similar, especially in like, let's say a six foot human male. Okay. Um, that probably has the build of a juvenile Sasquatch in some sort of way, because I, th- I think that the females are probably much stockier and bigger, like linebacky, like Patterson Gimlin's film subject sort of thing. But, um, like most, most humans aren't built like that. Most humans, six feet tall or whatever, are going to be thinner. And that, that sort of thinner build might be more resembling of say a teenage, you know, teenage animal of some sort worth human or sasquatch so maybe that's where it comes from you know like some sort of natural inclination is like well something that's that tall and built like that is probably not fully grown and therefore another juvenile and i'm going to play with it yeah definitely I'd, I'd agree with that now the study also showed that, that the apes engaged 18 distinct teasing behaviors um, that were used to elicit a response from the thing it was teasing, um, like waving and swinging body parts and or objects right in the other animal's face, or hitting or poking the other animals like the other apes, or staring closely into other apes' faces, um, disrupting targets' movements and pulling out the hair were all frequently seen as teasing behaviors. How many of those, Bobo, have you heard in Sasquatch reports? Waving arms or hands, swinging body parts, um, getting close to somebody's face, not that, not, not that so much, poking or hitting something, um, staring really hard, you know, that kind of stuff, or getting in the way of their movements, uh, pulling hair, any of, that, any of that stuff ring a bell to you? Yeah, like the uh, slapping, like if they, was it, they say like they'll slap, like if someone's sitting on a tree, they might slap the branch next to them or something even, or... Well, yeah. Well, think about slapping the outside of houses, you know? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's, that, that'd be real similar. Um, getting close and staring. I mean, maybe not close like they, those those uh, other apes they observed. Like, not that close, but they'll stare They'll stare you down. You know, like, they'll... But I think that is that is more of an intimidation than play when they stare you down. It definitely could be. Now, now here's something that, that they observed in some of the apes that, um, that I've heard a couple far-flung stories, but these are definitely outliers, okay? One of the things that um, they observed in these apes um, would be like making themselves look silly in a way. Um, in, the, in, in, the, in the article here, it mentions that children start doing playful things that push boundaries in different ways, like they might take a shoe and put it on their head as a hat and find that hilarious. Um, have you heard any sighting reports? Because you've heard a lot of stories in your time, you know. Have you heard any reports of people seeing Sasquatches of them with them doing something strange, you know, like using, like, I don't know, putting a shoe on top of the head for a hat or something like that? Some ridiculous thing like that. Um, have you heard any of that before? Not that comes up the top of my head. Gotcha. Because uh, I've, I've heard one or two stories um, about them maybe putting the clothing on themselves, kind of like what you see orangutans do every once in a while. I think one of them came from that Janice Carter book, if I remember right. Does that sound familiar? I mean, I've heard, I've, I've heard those, but I never talked to the person. I just read a few things like that. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, very interesting article. And it does kind of um, bring up some interesting questions about the way people interpret Sasquatch behavior. 
And I don't, I don't want to be the person to say, oh, they're just playing with you. And then somebody goes out and gets their arm broken or something like that. Like <laughs> Sasquatch, you know, but at the same time, maybe it's, it's kind of like what, you know, with our Australian friends, like uh, the early, like a lot of the Yowie researchers comment about how dangerous and all that. So there's uh, the Yowies are, and you know, maybe they are, or maybe they're just afraid of them because if, you know, f- that putting that fear in front of you makes all the um, behavior seem aggressive. You know what I mean? And people here in North America clearly do that as well, especially out in the dark and they don't see the aggressor and there's something there making noise and banging around and stomping and throwing things. Maybe it's fun. Maybe it's fun for the Sasquatch and it's just playing, you know, because, you know, bullies probably have a good time when they're bullying, for example. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. It it seems like most of the play with the the great apes in general was like what they refer to as playful teasing. Um, And, you know, a five and a half, six foot Sasquatch is going to look at us and want to bully us. I'm sure, you know, you figure, especially like a five or six foot, cause they can't really bully too many other Bigfoots, but they can bully a human. Yeah. No problem. We're, we're kind of wimps at the end of the day. Anyway. Yeah. I thought that was an interesting article. So, um, and it, it maybe it does shed a little bit of light on Sasquatch behavior in some sort of way. Um, but again, I'm not going to test that hypothesis If something is out there being, uh, seemingly aggressive with me, I will probably act accordingly and not just saying, Oh, he's just playing with us. Yeah. Cause that could be a fatal mistake. I think. Yeah. It, it, it could, it potentially could be. Yeah. I'm not too worried about it. Not too worried about it, but I don't know. You, you've, you've had them be pretty scared. Like think about your first encounter up there, you know, like what if that was just play and messing with you, which I'm sure they were messing with you, but you were scared, right? Oh God. Yeah. They weren't playing. They were intimidating. Or were they? On that one, I feel pretty confident saying they were <laughs> pure pure intimidation on that one. And, if, and I think that's probably the safer guess to go go with, I think, in any case. So anybody out there, don't, don't go, oh, they're just playing with me. You, you don't say that about brown bears either, right? It's like, oh, they're, they just want to lick me. They're just licking me because they love me. It's like, no, no, they're licking you because you're food. Like you should always treat at large wild animals with the utmost respect and keep your distance whenever possible. And if they're playing with you, let them have their fun. But you, you play, you play it safe. Right. That's my advice, and that's what the lawyers told me to say. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. How about that uh, archaeology story about the um, England's oldest footprints? Yeah, man, that that really puts back hominids being in that in that area. I mean, that that pushes the the bar so far back in time. It's a uh, it's really interesting because I, I used to like always be like kind of like man, they make these like definitive statements about these things that were at this time, and there was no humans or anything like that during these you know millennia. And I always thought like they, they're so cocky sounding when they say these things and i know it's like until further notice you know it's all that's always the deal but um yeah i mean i'm, I'm not surprised I'm, I'm, I'm never surprised when i hear stuff like that things are pushed way back you know like estimates of time and that sort of stuff yeah and and, and this particular basically that this particular um news article basically states that uh what is it 140 miles northeast of london in the uk Footprints were found um, uh, of a of a hominin, a human ancestor, that they're saying are are almost certainly Homo antecessor, which is um, the last common ancestor that we know of. Because you know, human evolution um, it, it absolutely happened, but it's still called a theory, um, not a law, because we're still we're still kind of putting together the puzzle pieces. How it happened? That's the question, not if it happened. That's not a question anymore. It's how it happened. So um, we believe at this point that Homo ancestor was probably the last common ancestor between Homo sapiens, that's us, and um, uh, Neanderthals, basically. So um, a common ancestor between our, our species and Neanderthals. So, um, But the fact that these were there in the UK is pretty cool. And the fact that they left footprints really, you know, perked my ears up as well, because I'm very interested in hominin footprints to see if there's any um, similarities between Sasquatch footprints and hom- other hominins in general. Um, most particularly, like when the arch developed, I think that's a very interesting question. 
because I think it was much more recently than a lot of other folks are, are, are suggesting out there. Like, did you know, for example, that they're saying that um, with some textbooks, literally textbooks, um, list that uh, um, Homo erectus had a developed arch. But that is, from what I understand, um, that is uh, without any evidence whatsoever because they don't have any feet bones. Like they don't have like a complete foot skeleton of Homo erectus. So they're, they're kind of walking on, they're kind of guessing on that one. I, well, I thought erectus was one of the ones that we had some of the most. Oh, I think we do. I, I think we do, but I don't believe we, ha- we have enough foot skeletons, uh, skele- like foot fossils to make that assumption at this point. But yet that's literally in textbooks. I remember having a conversation with Meldrum about that. And, you know, but um, maybe that textbook was 10 years old. Maybe they found some stuff in the meantime. Um, if, if anybody listening, because, you know, there's a, a few hundred people listening to this podcast. If anybody out there listening has access to a paper or something describing foot structure of Homo uh, erectus, I'd love to see it. I'm always interested in that kind of thing. You can email it to Matt Pruitt, our producer here, um, at BigfootBeyondPodcast at gmail.com, and then he will forward it to me. I would love to hear about any of that sort of stuff. I'm also really interested in learning about Paranthropus footprints, but our feet, I should say, foot bones. Um, but there's not a lot of stuff out there about them either. There's a few, uh, there's a few isolated bones, but nothing, nothing you can really piece together, so to speak. But anyway, um, the fact that I think here, the interesting thing of Homo ancestor being in the UK. There's evidence of this at the U- in the UK because of the dating of these footprints about a million years ago or so. Um, that's in, of interest probably, at least to the UK in, uh, researchers, because I, I think at this point, like I'm, uh, I'm thinking there probably aren't Sasquatches in the UK. You know, I don't know how you feel Bobo, but I'm feeling there probably are not Sasquatches in the UK, but a whole lot of people believe that to be true. There's a lot of UK researchers out there and then, um, you know, they're, they're out there doing what they can to show that, uh, that they were, that they are there. And good luck. I hope they are. But at this point, I don't see the evidence. So I'm thinking probably not. I don't want to upset any of our UK listeners, but that's just how I feel about it. And you know me, I'm always going to tell you the truth, even if you don't want to hear it. But um, the fact that uh, this hominin was there, well, that should that should be of some interest, um, I think, to our UK uh, listeners. If uh, if they're absolutely a flesh and blood creature, there's no way they have them there still. But if they are, you know, some kind of paranormal entity, like uh, there's some you know, the woo's strong with them. And maybe, maybe there is some sightings there, but I, I certainly don't think there's any chance of a hidden breeding population now. It'd be pretty tough. Pretty tough. Yeah. Now, when we were sent there for uh, finding Bigfoot, Bobo, um, what, what were your initial thoughts there? Well, I was excited because we heard that rumor that uh, Adam Davies, who we really respect and, you know, a good buddy, we heard that he had an encounter that he thought that they were there. So, like, we were all psyched. And then, we get over there and we find out that wasn't exactly what was what happened. So it it, it seemed, uh, and especially in England, it was like they took us to the biggest forest in England. It was what was it three miles by four miles or something like that. Yeah, it wasn't real big, you know. But uh, yeah, it wasn't real big at all. And I, um, you know, I don't. I think it was Matt and Renee. I don't think you were there. And correct me if I'm wrong, of course. But I think Matt and Renee did something in um, in like Sherwood Forest. Yeah, those guys that I didn't. Yeah, and apparently that's ridiculously small, like just a few acres or something. I don't know. I, I, I wasn't there. I don't remember, unfortunately. But I was just excited because of the Robin Hood thing, of course. Yeah, but when I when – I, I don't know if you were with me or not. I, I forget. But on the forest that I went to was basically a tree farm. You know, they're, they're, everything was planted in rows pretty uniformly. Um, not a lot of sign of anything. And, you know, it, 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 you know but such a location – um, thinking, you know, I assume that there are not Sasquatches there. So, <clears throat> such a location would be an interesting control group, you know, for a, a long duration recorder, I think, to go out there and say, count the number of strange vocalizations and tr- and possible tree knocks and all these sort of things um, as a control group for a forest that does have Sasquatches in it. I think that would be interesting, kind of a, the um, calibrate perhaps, you know, but I digress, but I digress. But anyway, homo antecessor in the UK, that's kind of cool. Especially if, uh, you know, what if, the, what if any of these sightings are actually real? Um, maybe there's another way to explain them because, you know, we don't really know, um, if Neanderthals were covered in hair or not. We just really don't know that. Um, and homo antecessor, you know, why, why wouldn't they be covered in hair? They might be covered in hair as well. It makes some sense, I think. Um, I mean, we're not, I mean, we're covered in hair. We just kind of lost most of the fur coating, 
but uh, we're, we're, we have all those hair follicles. So who's to say? Maybe, may, I, again, I'm, I'm just being generous here, but maybe some of these sightings, if they are real, um, are of one of these things, you know, some relic species of this. I mean, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I just, but who knows? Who knows? I didn't see these things. Possibilities there. I guess so. But again, I, I, maybe I'm being too generous. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. I know. That I, I certainly know um, oh, some people are adamant that Sasquatches are in the UK. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to be wrong in such a case. You know me. I'm pretty happy. to. I'm, I'm generally okay with being wrong anyway. You're going to be happy as hell, Cliff, when they finally show you three deers that they do break trees and they do leave higher, like glyphs behind sticks and structures and that sort of stuff. Oh, golly. I, th- I certainly think they break trees, Bobo. I just don't think that they make glyphs and like, they make little structures and stuff like that and to, to show you things. Maybe, maybe they do. I don't know. But I, 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 I'm completely confident they break trees. They've been seen doing it. That's the whole thing. That's the thing that stops me with the, the stick structure stuff. With with the prevalence of stick structures in in like the Bigfoot mindset, um, why is it that I you know you just don't get sighting reports of them making these things? But I, do they break trees? Absolutely, they've been seen doing it. Absolutely, do it's an it's a known ape behavior, and they've actually been a, a, a reportedly been seen doing it. I'm completely on board with that. And in fact, man, well, God, we found a uh, Dave here at the museum actually found a really weird thing out in the woods. That's very eye opening for me. It's not a structure or anything. I'm not going to call it that, but man, it is, uh, there was, and this is a location where, um, footprint casts have been taken before, by the way, within 20, 30 yards of the spot. Um, it's on this, this little out of the way seep coming down a hill, going feed into a larger river. Um, one of, one of the three or four research areas that we've been working like lately, and we kind of dispersing ourselves and trying to get into other areas we haven't been lately. And this is one of those, he found this tree that was about two inches in diameter, uh, broken six feet, eight inches off the ground. And, um, and like these other, uh, like branches were like, um, twisted and kind of interwoven into itself. I've seen a couple very weird things come out of this location before. Um, I've never with my own eyes, I've, I've never found anything. So Dave finding this independent of everybody else in one of our areas was, was very interesting to me. Um, some of the other people who work this area that we share data with, they show me some weird things, um, out of this area too, that kind of go along with this pretty well, I think, but yeah, very weird. I'll, I'll text it to you right now and you can check it out. So, oh, cool. Yeah. You can check it out. Um, it's, it's actually going to be featured in, um, in the next, uh, in the next North American Bigfoot Center video. Cause you know, we put out two videos of our own field research every single month for our museum members. Um, this will be featured in the next one. So our museum members, and I know there's a lot of overlap between our museum members and our listenership here. So all you NABC members will be able to see this very, very soon. So we did a whole video on it. It's so interesting. I gotta see that. Well, it, it's, it's out in cyberspace coming to you right now. All right. Let's see. Okay. We got something just came in from Cliff. Oh, wow. Yeah, wild, right? That's without a doubt a squatch. Or it's, it's I don't know. Remember, there's a couple of researchers that work this area. So I, I have to get in contact with them to find out, are you trying to talk to these Bigfoot things by doing stuff? You know, I mean, there's always that possibility. I don't know. Interesting things. So yeah, very peculiar tree thing. I wouldn't call it a structure. I don't know what to call that. It's more than a tree break, but it certainly isn't a structure. So I'm not sure what to do, what, what to do with that one. But I've seen other photographs um, taken by these researchers in this area where one of the trees has been like pulled down and, um, you know, smaller tree pulled down and, and one of these, you know, these arch things everybody talks about, but, um, but it's not just an arch that, that like clearly happens naturally all the time with vine maples and other, and other, and other plants like that. But, um, the branches were pulled around the trunk of another tree twice and then tied in a weird sort of crappy knot. Um, very weird stuff. I, again, I'd like to see these in person and do a close examination of them, but I have never found one myself and I've so far only seen photographs of, of these things. And um, the researchers say that, no, we found prints like right there, like 20 yards away. And this is was like, you know, on a, this really crappy road that there's no reason for anybody to ever walk on. It's like, oh, well, that's of interest. We'll see. Yeah. So how often do you talk to those guys? It'd be pretty easy for you to find out, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Once, once the weather clears up in a the, this 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 is kind of a higher elevation spot. So once um I, we can get up there, 
um, they've uh, they, they've commented that uh, they're going to take me to see these weird ones that they've shown me. And then this spot that uh, Dave has located is under snow now and probably will be for the next few weeks, at least depending on the weather. But um, I'll probably get out there in the next you know two months once we can. I thought we we're going to be set for the rest of the rest of the winter and spring here. It's like, cool, the weather's going to be great. Then all of a sudden it just, you know, dumped snow. I mean, I live at 700, seven or 800 feet in elevation and we had two or three inches on the ground yesterday. Cool. Yeah. I mean, well, good for, I mean, good for the water levels, but not good for squatching. All right, folks, well, we're going to wrap that up this episode. We're going to continue the conversation on Patreon for our Patreon subscribers. It's only $5 a month. So if you'd like to hear more of Cliff and Bobo every week, an extra episode, Sign up, and uh, the link's down below here in the show notes. I could I could add one thing there, Bob. So if, if you'd like, um, uh, Matt Pro, you can go ahead and post uh, that picture of that tree thing on the Patreon as well for our members to check out. Um, so if you, maybe that's kind of another added bonus to being a member of Bigfoot and Beyond podcast here because um, you get to see pictures of things that we don't put out to the regular public. There you go. Yeah, see, so sign up. We appreciate it. All right, so that's it for this week, folks. We'll see you next week. And until then, y'all keep it squatchy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond, that's an N in the middle, and tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond.